All right, Alex, I've hit the red, the red light here, which this really freaks out most people. So uh, let's see if you're a pro here and you can get over the, uh, the freak outness of the, uh, the red light syndrome. It's recording, it's recording. So why don't we do a, do a quick sound check? Um, why don't you tell my listeners what you had for breakfast this morning? Actually, nothing yet. I'm just having a cup of coffee. Cup of coffee. All right, all right. Are you usually a uh, breakfast person? I am usually. Uh, usually, like, I'm on the go. Okay. And I grab something on the way out, and it, you know, but I'm still home. So. All right. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, I think let's, uh, that's a good answer for that. Let's, uh, let's jump right into it. So why don't you tell my listeners um, what you're currently raising money for uh, over on Kickstarter? Sure. So we're raising money for Pharaoh's Watches. It's um, a micro brand that my partner, my business partner, Craig and I started a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. It's a, you know, just a unique looking watch with a fully automatic Swiss movement. We designed everything uh, from the ground up, everything is very original, hmm. and it's a brand that we want to launch. We both have a passion for watches. Um, it, it looks unique in the sense of it's got it's got a full loom dial. Hmm. Um, the case is very different. It's not a generic looking case. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. That's cool. That's cool. So where does this sort of idea start in terms of uh let's make a watch you know craig and i hey we should make a watch you know it doesn't seem like that's the first thing that most most guys get together and do maybe you play some basketball maybe do something else but now you guys are making watches so how do you get into that so we both went to law school together in new york city and both him and i are watch collectors we have a lot of different watches and throughout law school we sort of bonded over that uh hobby if you want to call it you know just like collecting watches looking at watches and then about three years ago, so I'm currently living in Los Angeles. He stayed in New York. So I moved away after law school in 2012. And then three years ago, which was uh, about 2015, 2016, um, we started talking about starting a business in the watch space. And we thought it would be cool to maybe launch uh, an online marketplace for selling watches. Hmm. But that space is somewhat concentrated. There's a lot of online watch marketplaces. There's a lot of companies that do that, that resell watches. And then he suggested launching our own company in the watch space, just designing our own watch and then launching, fu- uh, raising funds through Kickstarter. So hmm. that's how it came about. And then we just started brainstorming. That's, that, that's sweet. So what makes like a watch collector? You, guys met both, you mentioned that both of you and Craig are, are watch collectors. So like, you know, is it, is that like, uh, you know, guys who collect old Jordans, you know, like what, what, what does that entail? Yeah, sort of, you know, just, you know, we appreciate watches. We like the way they look. Um, and it's just, I don't know, just a, a basic appreciation and, uh, they're all very different, uh, different movements. Uh, you, you know, there's Japanese movements, there's Swiss movements, they look different. Um, yeah, it's more of an aesthetic thing, maybe just like, you know, wearing watches and they look cool and, um, yeah, that's cool. That's, that's awesome. So where, like in your timeline though, where do watches maybe start filling into this sort of idea? Like where, where do you start liking them? Are you a young kid? Is it something when you're in law school, where do you start to kind of appreciate watches? Um, I'd say in, in high school, I, I bought my first watch in high school. It was a, a victory Knox, and yeah, from there, you know, I, I just liked the way it looked and, you know, I started looking at other time pieces and then you know i discovered rolex and uh, omega and panerai and all these different brands which are more expensive than what we're selling we're not competing with those brands but we want to do something almost as good of a quality as those companies have sure sure so what's the first thing like out of the gate so okay now you decide hey we should you know the 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 first the first watch idea isn't going to work because it's a crowded space so you decide to sort of make your own watch What's the first step out of the gate? Like, do you start to draw, sketching something out? Do you find inspiration? What starts happening at that point? Yeah, we just looked at other brands in the marketplace. Uh, we considered replicating or modifying other companies that are out there. But then we just thought it'd be cooler to design it on our own. Mm-hmm. So we started sketching things out. We brought on a watch designer to help us out. And we started brainstorming of you know, just how it should look and what kind of elements the watch should have. And we wanted to concentrate on this full loom uh, dial for the watch because that's not really common in the marketplace. And it looks really cool and it's different and it'll stand apart from other companies. 
Mm, yeah, that, that, I agree with you. I mean, I, I've looked at a lot of watches on Kickstarter. There's a, there's a ton of them, right? And just kind of going through them and stuff. And, and you're right, this one did stand out. Hence us getting on a podcast where I'm like, hey, let, let's see what's going on here. I'd like to find this out. Um, but what, you know, and in terms of like story, you mentioned like the, the brand name and stuff on the Kickstarter page. Where does that sort of inspiration come from to, to name it what you did and have the inspiration around the, the lighthouse and stuff? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the watch it shines the the dial retains a lot of light and it it shines at night so we wanted to name it something along the lines of you know like alluding to light so maybe call it lighthouse and we thought lighthouse is just too direct it's like on the nose like we're not going to just call it lighthouse we wanted it to be more subtle Mm -hmm. so we started doing more research and we came across the pharos of alexandria which is an ancient lighthouse and we're like that's pretty cool why don't we just name it Pharaohs? Because that's still sort of, it's an homage to a lighthouse, but it's more subtle and it's a cool name. Mm. Well, we decided to call it Pharaohs. We did a, you know, a check, we did a trademark check, made, made sure that it's available and we, we could use that. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's, it's, it's really, it feels like it just went together perfectly. It's like one of those moments probably where you're just like, and this is like all lining up, you know, yeah, that yeah, we, we can use, number one, we can use the name, you know, and there's, you know, there's, you know, it's not like you come up with a great idea and you realize, oh yes, we trademarked that back in 70, yeah. 78, you know, we can't use it. So exactly. Like that. That's, that's great. That's great. So, you know, running a Kickstarter campaign is, you know, there's a ton of stuff going on right now. Kind of t- talk a little bit about how you've kind of partnered, you know, you and your partner, Craig, and how you guys are handling sort of communication and, and all the mm-hmm. things that are going on in terms of the campaign. Like, how do you guys sort of structure that behind the scenes? So. We knew that it would be important to to actually have an email list, a, a list of subscribers that would buy into your product. So we started, uh, we ran ads on Facebook. We made sure that people would subscribe to, to, the, to the product. So we started advertising Pharos as an up and coming brand, as something that's gonna be launching. Um, and then also through Instagram. My partner, Craig, he's got a couple of different accounts that he runs on Instagram that have pretty large followings. So we started building up those accounts and advertising it through that mm-hmm. to make sure that people would you know, be aware of the company and that when we did launch on Kickstarter, they would you know, tune in and actually contribute to the campaign. What, what behind the scenes is maybe something that keeps you up at night in terms of like being now a watchmaker and, and running a Kickstarter campaign? What's sort of the behind the scenes of like, you know, these are the things that we worry about a little bit around here? I mean, at the moment, it's just driving the pledges. You know, we're about, we're about 19 days left into the into the campaign, and we want to get more contributions, obviously. Mm-hmm. So that's keeping me up, and you know, it goes up and down. You know, some people pledge, then people re, uh, they cancel their pledges. So that's a little stressful. At the <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old the old cancel pledges. Just you're like, what? What's going on, man? It doesn't get charged for another 20 days or whatever it is. Why are you canceling right now? Yeah. yeah. We're reaching um, out. We're trying to trying to incentivize everyone, um, but yeah, that's just you know part of the part of the business. Yeah, was there any sort of like major roadblock that you guys had to pivot around or had to change something in the course of the last couple of years where you're just like we you, you know maybe you couldn't do something that you wanted to do? Was there was there any sort of major roadblock at all? Um, lining up all the distribution channels with our manufacturing partners, making sure that they could deliver and source all the parts that we need. Mm-hmm. The watch itself, it's assembled in the U.S., and the the movement is from Switzerland. Everything else is made in China, but then it's assembled in the U.S. So making sure that we have that supply chain laid out, that was a little stressful, and we had a a couple of pickups, and we had to, you know, pivot and change partners here and there, but, you know, so. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, it definitely happens. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah, And, and how about, like, you know, on the flip side of that, what was sort of like, was there a moment where just everything gelled where you're like, we actually really have something, even, even if it was like just a watch, but you knew you had a watch that was special enough to, you know, continue down the Kickstarter path. Was there, was there just a moment where you just knew that you really had something that you could, you should keep pursuing? So when we got the first prototypes, that was really cool because, you know, we've never seen the watch in person. It was being manufactured and then it was delivered finally. We got one right here. Nice. <laughs> um, th- that was really cool because like it came in and it looked just as good as we hoped hoped it would. It, everything lined up it, and yeah, that was yeah. We knew at that point that we could keep moving forward and do a full scale production run and actually manufacture the, this product. That's cool. That's that's awesome. So 
back to sort of like maybe like the, the, the team and stuff, just kind of following up in terms of, you know, how do you guys stay organized? Is there any special tools that you guys use to stay, you know, to stay on top of all the communications and the, the supply chains and all the sort of plates that are spinning right now? Is there any advice or, or tips or techniques that you do to stay organized on this sort of stuff? Well, we have a separate email account for this business specifically. So when we communicate with whoever, it, it always goes into one inbox. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the workflow sort of, you know, split up between Craig and myself. Uh, he handles a lot of the social media, a lot of the posting uh, on the Instagram page. I do a lot of the, the operational stuff. So organizing the company, making sure everything is set up, we setting up the bank account, getting contracts in place with people, things mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Right. That's the, the sexy work. It sounds like right there, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and then also, I mean, you know, I, I think this is always good to hear for like, um, you know, project creators who don't understand how, how much work it goes into one of these campaigns. I mean, it's just, it's a ton of work. What do you do to sort of unwind though for a little bit to unplug for a, a little bit? Cause I mean, you could probably work on this every single day if you wanted to. So like, you know, what, what do you do to just, you know, find a little bit of moment of peace uh, for yourself? It's hard. I have a day job as a lawyer <laughs> and then I do this. So managing a, managing a legal practice and a side business. There's not a lot of time off. Right. You know, I try to exercise, try to go for a run, do something on the weekends with friends, you know, just to sort of unplug. Uh, so that helps. Yeah. Yeah. I bet, I bet, yeah. Staying, active. Staying active is helpful. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I hear that, man. It's, I always try to, it's like, no matter what I tell a potential client or something about how much work it is, it's like literally three times more than what I probably even, you know, I'm even leading on to. Cause I'm just like, it's a lot of work. It's trust me. It's a lot of work. I'm like, Oh no, 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 it won't be that bad. And like, right, right, right. No, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. So let's go. Well, we talked a little bit uh, a moment ago about the actual Kickstarter, but let's, let's, let me pull up some numbers here real quick. So, I mean, you know, right now when we're talking about have about 19 days to go, mm-hmm. um, you had a $35,000 goal and you're currently sitting at just under 55,000. So you've done a, you know, you've crushed your goal. Uh, you got 99 backers that, you know, it's a really successful campaign. So what, you know, internally, were there any metrics you were looking at that you wanted to hit before you launched the campaign? Did you say we want to have X amount of emails, this many people on Facebook, this many video views? Was there anything along those lines that you wanted to hit before you uh, launched? I mean, we purposely set the the goal a little lower than we should. I mean, we want to raise more than 55000 so we, we set it at 35 just because Kickstarter doesn't let you keep the funds if you don't hit your goal. And we were a little worried. We didn't know that we would reach the goal so quickly. So th- that was one consideration. Um, essentially, there's a baseline number that we did want to hit at a minimum, which is right around 50, 55,000. We, mm-hmm. we achieved that, which is great. But we want to keep it pushing and we want it to go to around 100,000, ideally. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't want to set it too high. We didn't want to set it at a hundred thousand because if you don't hit it, then it's not like Indiegogo where you keep whatever you raise. Right. Yeah. So, so because of that, you know, when you're kind of doing the sort of math formula, I guess I still go back to like, well, then to hit that, did you have some numbers in mind of like, well, if we have a thousand email addresses, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be good, you know, we'll feel good about it. Or, or was there anything, any trigger points where you're like, we are now ready to launch or was it a little kind of blind and being like, we'll just see what happens here. So typically email lists that you compile, they, they convert at about a, I think like 3% number. Mm-hmm. So whatever you have, 3% of those people will purchase your product. So we wanted to have a certain amount of emails in the pipeline. Uh, that was really important. And then getting the word out to friends and family that helped as well. Um, and then through Facebook and Instagram, but there was no baseline number, like a minimum number that we needed. Right. I don't think, Yeah. It was just, you know, the more, the better. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so, you know, and, and how about, I mean, you talked about this before too, is that there is a ton of, uh, there are a ton of watches, you know, on Kickstarter. So how did you, how did you guys approach standing above the crowd, making sure that you get funded, make sure you stand out? You know, what was some of the internal conversations around how, how do you, you know, become a success story as opposed to maybe 30 other watches right now that, that aren't success stories? How, you know, how, how did you sort of prepare yourself for that sort of um, journey? I mean, the watch had to be different. It mm-hmm. had to look unique and not like the rest. A lot of these watches look identical. They take the same case and then just repurpose it and slap a different name on it. But it's the same watch. You know, they all look like a, a Rolex Submariner, like something along those lines. Right. Um, so we wanted to stand out, obviously. 
and we needed we needed a presence online on social media that was really important because without a presence people don't know about you and that's where instagram and facebook was was really helpful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and then it was just sort of you know we sat there and hoped hope for the best <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great has there been uh, anything in the dashboard that stuck out that's weird um you know in terms of like oh we had a whole bunch of orders from brazil you know or just what you know is anything weird that you're kind of taken aback by at all not like that but but a few investment funds and inv- they pledge towards your campaign in the hopes of getting some kind of business out of you and mm-hmm. then if you don't bite then they cancel their pledge <laughs> that was interesting yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. That, that sort of uh, that gets your hopes up, and you're like, "Yes!" Exactly. This random what? person is investing in my company, but then like <laughs> taking a loan at five percent, then they cancel. Oh man, man, I haven't heard that one. So, congrats yeah. on that. That's the first time I've heard of that one. And uh, you're episode one forty three. So I've talked to a lot of people. I've run a lot of campaigns. I haven't heard that one yet. So I'll, that's something new to look out for. Uh, Business is out there. Just I mean, trying. To- trying to get a piece for themselves. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's, that's crazy. So, I mean, so, okay, you've got, you know, 19 days to go while we're talking mm-hmm. you know, a couple of weeks for the money to drop in all the bank accounts. What starts happening at that point for you to get the watch uh, into backers hands? Right. So we get the money, we notify the manufacturer in, in China and Switzerland and our service partner in the U S we place the orders and hopefully, you know, everything goes according to plan. But, you know, so far we've been assured that everything is lined up, the factories are running and we have prototypes in hand. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just waiting at that point. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, for this, and you're shipping internationally, correct too, right? I, yeah, I think. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, I think this is, this is challenging for a lot of small businesses getting started is managing international shipping and orders and parts coming in from other countries and oh that you know our parts from china are going to be on a boat for two months whatever or there, there's a like customs you know how do you guys prepare to handle all of these sort of things that could pop up not saying they are but could pop up um in your process right. so i mean there's third-party companies like backer kit and crowdox they help you manage your orders mm-hmm. so that helps on the acquisition front with your customers but then on the supply side it's going to be just a lot of manual work with excel spreadsheets making sure everything's coming in and you know tracking it that way the good thing is that we're dealing with only about 99 backers at the moment maybe we'll get to like 150 or 200 but that's manageable that's not too many we're not dealing with thousands of backers which would be a lot right so then what does for you guys where do you guys see like at least like the next year? Obviously, I'm sure getting all the you know these orders into uh, these watches on people's wrists. But what starts happening in that year? Is it something that you move this into e-com or do you start making new designs for Kickstarter? What what starts happening? So both. We want to build out a good website and then design new watches, mm. make different dials, make different cases possibly, make a fe- more female centric version of the watch, mm. and just expand the company. Uh, try to get social media influencers on board is that's very important for growing your, your brand. Because right now it's all through e-commerce and social. Really, no one goes to the store to buy watches. Right. So it's all about building a cool brand that people, that people like. And, and how do you kind of envision the legal side? I mean, being a lawyer full-time yeah. and this, where, do you see that something that you're, you're able to do kind of both all, the whole time? Or do you see yourself kind of outsourcing a bit? Where, where do you kind of envision yourself in the next year or so? I'll do both as long as I can, but hopefully as this business scales and moves forward. And if it takes up more and more of my time, then for sure, you know, I'd consider doing this more full time. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then let, like, let's walk out maybe like five years or so. Is this something that you kind of envision, you know, do you guys, what, what's like the big, huge dreams down the road that, that are at least kind of, you know, that are, yeah. they're, they're around, you know, they may be challenging, but what's like the big dreams? I mean, the dream is to build it up, build up the company and sell it sort of like what movement did. Robotic <laughs> yeah. Robotic. Yeah. For an insane price. So that would be the, the dream, you know, building yeah. up a business and selling it. That's cool. That's cool. Well, where can people, um, you know, dive in, learn more? How can they kind of plug in and see what you guys are working on? Sure. So the Kickstarter page is really informative. There's a, there's a video, there's a lot of good pictures. There's the, the design process and information about the Pharaohs of Alexandria is up there. So it gives you a good overview of how the watch came together. Um, we have an Instagram page, Barrow's Watches, which is also really cool. There's a lot of good photographs that aren't available on the Kickstarter page. On Facebook, 
Um, and then, you know, just through the internet, we, we, have, a, we have a website. Uh, the Pharaohs of Alexandria Wikipedia page is cool because it talks about the history of the lighthouse. That's cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Alex, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I know there's a lot going on here, a bunch of, bunch of plates spinning. And uh, I, always, I, always, I always love reaching out to creators who are in the middle of a successful campaign, kind of getting their vibe and energy. And uh, these watches do look great. I mean, I, I see how they stood out and you're, you're doing an amazing job on this. And uh, I wish you nothing but success. I, uh, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. That was great. Awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. All right, cool. Take care.